team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU is also the parent company of Michigan Virtual School, a supplemental state-sponsored virtual school, Michigan LearnPort, an online professional development portal for K-12 educators and personnel, and MyBlend, a blended learning initiative providing K-12 schools with resources, products, and services to personalize learning options for their students and improve student achievement. A quick disclaimer for today's webinar. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. We have with us presenting today Dr. Randy Labonte, who has been a senior level executive for over 30 years in the education sector and works and teaches online in the K-12, post-secondary, and corporate training sectors. His doctoral research led him to take on the role of lead consultant and researcher for seven years at the BC Ministry of Education, and he was a member of a team that researched distance education for the Alberta government. He was central in development of policy, agreements, and e-learning standards, as well as led the design and implementation of the quality review process for BC online K-12 schools. He presently teaches online courses for Vancouver Island University and recently took on the role of Chief Executive Officer for the Canadian e-learning network, uh, which you can find more about at the web address there, canelearn.net, while continuing his other contact, contract work and studies. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Labonte. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Appreciate that. And I uh, just want to say hi to everyone. Um, coming to you, beaming to you from sunny uh, north of Victoria, British Columbia, where uh, the interior temperature is about 75 degrees in my office, hence the short sleeve shirts. Um, about 24 degrees. Uh, we've got sun and brilliant. And uh, we always on the West Coast uh, in Canada, we always start talking about the weather for some reason. Um, but uh, I hope it's uh, doing well back east. And I'm going to actually introduce a couple of folks for, who are members of the Canadian eLearning Network who have joined in. I'm going to invite their voices if they can or their text chat. So I'll start with you, Michael Canuel, who is the chair of the board of Canny the Canny Learn Group uh, coming to us from Quebec. So, Michael, do you want to say hello? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and to, uh, to join you this uh, this afternoon. It's a, as Randy said, typical Canadian uh, introduction. It is cold and windy here in Montreal, but uh, uh, nice and sunny, so we're enjoying it for now. And we also have Karen Gledhill from BC, who's in the warmth as well. Anyone else uh, self-declaring from Canada here? Good. Okay. So this, what I wanted to do is try to make this um, as much uh, a part of uh, a, a, an interactive session as we could and we can. Uh, so I'm looking for your questions, your feedback. So feel free to text. Uh, in the chat area at, uh, at your convenience uh, with questions that you may want to ask, uh, with anything else that you, you may want to comment on or look for more information. What I'm going to do is not really a panel, but I will invite Michael to text in and chime in. Um, just want to do a bit of a sort of a cross Canada piece. But before I do, um, where did this title come from? So it's kind of one that actually came from <clears throat> uh, Kevin Udewal, who's uh, Director of Technology in Alberta and also a board member, that we talked about the 007 kind of thing. So I kind of centered this around the silver bullet because we're always seeming in education to be looking for that silver bullet, the solution that is sort of out of the box and is one that can be applied everywhere. We hear the term about, uh, you know, best practice. Well, Best practice in Quebec is way different than best practice in BC because the circumstances are so much different. 
Same thing for Alberta and across the country. It depends on your region, your zone. It depends on whether or not you're dealing with First Nations or whether it's Francophones. So there's so many different measures by which that is. So we are going to talk a little bit about what's happening in Canada in the online as well as in the classroom base, but more importantly as well, how the policy, the funding models tend to interfere either by supporting or uh, diminishing uh, innovation practices and emerging trends in both blended and online. So I don't think there is a silver bullet, but um, perhaps I can be dissuaded that there might be a better uh, one. So the intent here uh, for this, uh, this afternoon, if you're back east, for us in the morning on the west coast, is to kind of talk a little bit about some successes, challenges that we've come to know. The network, talk, I'll tell you a little bit about the Canadian e-learning network, but really um, focusing a little bit more on some of the challenges that, that leaders are trying to address. And more importantly as well, getting some voices uh, and some feedback from you yourselves and to see how the events and, and things that are transitioning in Canada may actually fit within your own uh, organization or in your own practices. So we've been meeting uh, at INACL as Canadians uh, who are in the online uh, practices mostly um, over the past number of years. And we finally said, with the help and support of INACL, um, to say, let's go create something on our own. So uh, with the commitment of the individuals who are part of our network that's being stitched together, we started to create some events and we started to sort of hammer out a focus. So we created uh, a mission uh, that we're trying to champion student success in online and blended, but we really are about networking, collaboration, and research. And that's why we're also strong members of the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and supportive of the work that's there. So uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work over the past little while, and uh, we've had a number of people come together. And just to give you an example of who is in, in the organization, uh, there's a list of our board of directors. And so you see we kind of span across the country. Um, we have a little bit more, um, shall we say, uh, connections in the West, largely because of the people that have been immediately involved and the work that has been going on in, in the past here. But we also have a large number um, in Ontario, uh, but Ontario is pretty well networked, as you'll see, uh, within their own province. So it gives you an idea in terms of who's who in the, in, the, in the zoo, so to speak. And we've been fostering a lot more um, events, um, both across Canada. We've not created something new. We've actually tied into other things, much like we're doing with the research side here, is trying to um, shine a light on events through events, some things that are happening in our own backyard. We're vast geographically. Um, when you consider the Northwest Territories through uh, the east to west coast, uh, much larger geographic issues, much less populated, therefore uh, a really strong drive and need in Canada to kind of connect and collaborate and support and do things together. So that's what's driving us to into the, the, the network, so to speak. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a, a view across Canada uh, for that. So around issues, challenges, and innovation, but basically what's happening in the leadership front for folks. But before I jump in there, um, Michael or Karen or anyone else want to chime in with any opening comments or anything else based on Fair enough. I'll watch the text chat, so feel free to do so. So just for a way of background for those of you that are not familiar, is Canada is like <clears throat> like the US, there's provinces instead of states, but education uh, is a provincial mandate. So the federal government doesn't have any say in terms of what's happening in education in each of the provinces. So we operate in silos, really pretty much. There's cross-provincial agreements that do occur, um, but um, those that are more isolated in smaller groups, uh, notably the Francophone and the First Nations, really do a lot more networking across the country than those of us in public and independent uh, education. We don't have a large degree of charter schools. There are some charter schools <clears throat> that have formed in Alberta, but essentially, uh, other than the Catholic uh, school boards, the public school boards, and then there are the independent schools, uh, those tend to be sort of the, 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 the main groups within Canada. 
and most of them are funded um, provincially from governments. So the taxes from the local residents in the province are the ones that are supporting education. Or politically, you know, what happens in terms of downturns of economy like happening in the oil industry. So Alberta is it's facing a, a real challenge in terms of its budgets, which has a direct impact and effect on education. But as I mentioned, the geography is one of the issues. Connectivity has been uh, an issue in, in many places, and some have actually moved forward in terms of connectivity to address. Um, Alberta has got a very strong infrastructure called SuperNet, and all of these factors affect how learning occurs, how it can be organized, and really affects what's happening in terms of practices. <clears throat> Uh, for that. And in some cases, some provinces have gotten together and provincially brokered core technology licenses. So there's a province-wide license for desire to learn in Ontario, which is free and open to anyone. They had it just for the online uh, schools before. Now they've opened it up to classrooms. And there's a huge uh, increase in terms of classroom teachers that are working with technology. So I'll talk a little bit about that as, as sort of we move along. But those are factors when we kind of think about uh, what's practice in Canada and happening. So most of this, and I'm going to give credit. Jump. Sorry, go ahead. Just because uh, uh, Justin was asking for an explanation uh, uh, about when we refer to First Nations groups in Canada, maybe you could just go over that. Uh, well, it's our Aboriginal uh, residents, so to speak, who were here, uh, the First Nations education uh, band schools, many band schools have uh, the ability to provide the education. That's their their band members <clears throat> do not have to register in a public school if they're registered in a band school. Now there's a lot of First Nations folks that do end up in public systems or in private independent systems, but as well, uh, many of the bands run their own educational programs. They are funded federally. Uh, they're not funded through the province. Uh, although when they do address, and Michael, you can probably speak to this a little bit better, maybe add in a little bit more around First Nations as well. Exactly as Randy was saying, we add to all of this the First Nations, really are all the Aboriginal groups across Canada. Um, uh, we have the Mohawk, the Cree, uh, all across Canada. They do come under federal uh, funding. They work actually in many ways more as a network. And we also have the Inuit communities in the far north, in the uh, northern Quebec, in the uh, um, uh, uh, what's the name of our new territory, Randy? I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> First Nations as well. And we, we refer to them as a separate group very often simply because of the funding model which supports them. Yeah, fair enough. And, and again, so again, policy and funding are huge drivers in terms of what happens in practice or sharing or networking. So those are some of the challenges that we're looking at as well. But we do have Howard Burston, who is from um, Manitoba First Nations, uh, as a member of the board as well, and we'll continue to look for that representation. So again, I'm going to give credit to a lot of this research because it was it's spearheaded and led by Michael Barber. Uh, who's been uh, trying to model the Keeping Pace report that comes out through INACL and created one specifically for Canada called State of the Nation. Uh, once we formed the network, it became more prudent for us to uh, manage this sort of research that's been done uh, through the Canadian e-learning network uh, as opposed to uh, a, a principal investigator through an institution. Uh, because the institutions have all their sort of hoops and, and, and jumps, as, as Catherine probably quite well knows. Um, but we're trying to tie this and relate it to the work that's uh, going on at INACL, with Michigan Virtual here, as well as other research clearinghouses. But we also want to start consolidating this on our own. So um, we're taking the work that Michael started going further and building it into and as part of our own website. Now, we're still in very early startup stages as a network. We're not polished. I may be called the CEO, but this is just a very, very small part of what I do. Um, and it's, it's, we've all been operating sort of on the sides of our desks uh, to a certain extent, which brings a lot of passion and leadership and dedication through the volunteerism. And it's been a great experience and a great group to be involved with. So, but we watch for us to, uh, to, to evolve a little bit more. So the State of the Nation report has sort of mapped some of the areas. So briefly, in, in, the, in the Atlantic provinces and the Maritimes, uh, Newfoundland Labrador has its own individual program run by the province, same with Nova Scotia. 
Uh, Prince Edward Island uses, because it's small, it uses sort of the programs from other places. Uh, and New Brunswick has, again, a provincial uh, program. Uh, whereas that's different when you come across the rest of Canada. Uh, what's interesting is Nova Scotia Virtual School, uh, where we have Sue Taylor Foley, who's a member of our board, and in here as well. So maybe Sue, if you could maybe text chat or use the mic just to give us a little bit of background about what's happening in terms of innovation and leadership uh, for you there in Nova Scotia. if you know how to operate the mic, but uh, <laughs> there you go, she's texting. Fair enough. Um, so basically a lot of provincial-wide um, initiatives uh, are much more consolidated and streamlined. So there's a consistent use of learning management systems. There's a typically a resource strategy in terms of creation of content and resources. Um, and teachers uh, are, are, you know, are brought into uh, from the, the field as well and brought in to work with the courses. So there's a good flow between and among schools and programs. And since working through there, you can see, um, okay, fair enough, <clears throat> and a growth mode. But yes, a five-fold increase since 2008 uh, in terms of work that's happening. And yes, and, and Nova Scotia is doing a lot of focus on professional learning and support for teachers. Uh, and because it is provincially driven uh, within that, then there's, you know, there's teachers that are both online as well as classroom based. So, uh, and we're learning a lot from some of the work that Nova Scotia is doing as well. And they've been sharing that with others in the network across Canada, uh, which sometimes doesn't always happen. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And that's important because the, the as I, you'll see later, I comment that we're blurring the lines between what used to be distance education and what was in the classroom. And Quebec, I'll let Michael, I'll let you uh, chat a little bit about uh, Quebec in terms of francophone and anglophone. As well. Thanks, Randy. Um, for those of you who are not aware, Quebec really is a, a little bit distinct from the rest of Canada, primarily for linguistic reasons. Uh, 80, no, 90 percent of the population here really is a, uh, French speaking, and a lot of the work that goes on here uh, really takes place in French. The English community is, is small, vibrant but small, and what's happened over the years is that um, while a lot of emphasis and energy has been put into uh, developing a very uh, 21st century curriculum, uh, legislation and ruling around the uh, uh, online and uh, learning has really uh, uh, followed suit. And as a result, uh, while learn has been giving classes online and really blending it in a whole variety of ways since 1999. Um, we're only now working with our, our provincial ministry to uh, try to find um, uh, an official way that we can do this with their recognition and support. And so uh, we're actually in the process of creating the first uh, virtual school for Quebec, uh, which will hopefully will go into a, a place uh, as of um, uh, September. Ironically, again, what they're doing is they're using the English community here as Quebec as a little bit of a pilot model uh, for it. And if it works, then they're going to go with the, uh, the French community as well. Uh, we've had a lot of challenges, and just very quickly, as uh, Randy was talking about, uh, Learn's model, the, because of, of this is the name of our organization, Learn. Um, we've been blending education in a variety of ways. We, we like to say we have a synchronous, asynchronous uh, approach, and we have children in, in classrooms. So uh, um, even the whole notion of, uh, of blending is, is becoming so complex and, and so interesting. But uh, a lot of interesting and exciting things happening here uh, in Quebec. Um, although we've been very insular over the years, uh, I think there's a, a real desire to reach out and uh, collaborate and, and network a lot more. It's, it's emerging, but it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, so a little bit around Quebec, and then of course there's always um, we jokingly in the West call it the center of the universe in terms of Toronto. Um, Ontario is one of the most populated and is really quite uh, well organized, both in terms of its francophone, but also in terms of its anglophone. Um, and there's recently 18 boards uh, pulled together and created uh, a consortium, the eLearning Ontario Consortium. There's also eLearning Ontario, which is a, a provincially led 
uh, group that is uh, supporting e-learning for both classroom-based as well as the online programs. Uh, they've organized provincial licenses, content, uh, they've dealt with privacy issues. Uh, it's a really, really well organized and uh, pretty streamlined. Uh, and they're making a pretty good penetration and effect in terms of classrooms uh, and as well as uh, penetration in terms of students. So a few facts here, sorry about the question marks, that was a little bit just in the translation from PowerPoint into PDF. But in terms of those involved in e-learning, you can see the numbers that are close to 30,000 students. Uh, when you then factor in those that are classroom-based, uh, specifically in terms of funding, you get you know, a significant number of students that are directly involved in the uh, online learning um, and blended learning in the province. So there's a lot, those are, um, I believe those are, those are students in terms of headcount. I'd have to go back and check my source because I got this from Urs Bill, who from eLearning Ontario, uh, and did that presentation. I'm not sure whether if that uh, mobile is Michael Barber, he might have a comment <laughs> as well. So uh, suffice to say that it is a, a pretty, a pretty, um, pretty well um, penetrated group in Ontario as well. The other thing that they're doing that's kind of interesting and different from other provinces. I know Alberta is trying to move in this direction as well. Uh, has been, uh, but they have a group of e-learning contacts. So they've got sort of the professional learning experiences by zone, and they, these contacts are in the school districts to support classroom teachers uh, in terms of working online and online teachers. So they really have uh, moved forward in terms of the actual professional learning aspect. Uh, so practices are emerging. There's a lot of blogging. There's a lot of uh, um, you know, uh, sharing of experiences. But what's interesting, again, I go back to the provincial silos. It's really not penetrating as much across other areas in the country. Um, so as a network, we have to go into Ontario, create an event in order to connect with folks there. But again, geography restricts our ability to, to move across Canada and, and, and get a sense in terms of what's happening uh, elsewhere. Um, Michael had mentioned about the Yukon, uh, Northwest Territories, Nunavut. Um, their challenges are, are different, and again, they're usually um, driven through a, a, a government-based initiative uh, for their programs. I know that uh, I've been working with folks in the Yukon who have started a virtual school uh, of their own independently uh, as well. Uh, their challenges rest a lot in terms of both geography, um, a number of students on a wide base that can't really physically come together because of the distances involved, uh, as well there's connectivity issues that they face because many of the communities uh, do not have good bandwidth or access. Uh, a large majority of them are on dial-up modem still, so it's a bit of a hinterland, so to speak, there. So they have been working directly with those south of them uh, for support as well, and I think Sue's going to make a comment here as well in terms of the work that may be happening with Nunavut. Newfoundland Labrador has also been um, working with others. I know the Territories has been working directly with folks in Alberta and the Yukon and BC because their curriculum matches. There you go. Lots of locally hosted blended learning in Yukon and one centralized school. So that's what's interesting in terms of what's emerging, but um, again, a lot of the practices in these remote areas are really drifting uh, into a technology-supported uh, approach uh, just simply because it will allow students to get better credits and more, more education for them. So out west, uh, we've got a variety of different sort of approaches where we have uh, some that are district-based and others that are sort of provincially-based or provincial programs. So in Manitoba, we have uh, uh, <clears throat> three province-wide programs and sort of driven through uh, government. Saskatchewan, it's a little bit more uh, open in terms of districts that are uh, doing that. So there is some collaboration that is beginning to uh, to take a good foothold in Saskatchewan, and we're hoping to support that through the network. In Alberta, they have a province-wide program, but a lot of increase in district base as well, uh, both online, but more importantly, really shifting into blended. And I know that I'm, we're working with a group in Alberta that is uh, fostering a symposium on Blend Ed is the name of it, uh, the symposium on blended and online 
learning uh, that will be happening in the fall. So a lot that are happening out of Alberta. They've done some curriculum revisions and revamping that are happening. And I certainly can tell you a little bit about what's going on in British Columbia because of my past experiences. But in Alberta, um, there's been a real focus on, on some creativity and innovation. Inspiring Education was a policy document that was um, instituted through a series of conversations and dialogues with uh, constituent stakeholders in education. And it's really driven a lot of technology-led pieces. I mentioned in Alberta before that they had laid down their infrastructure called SuperNet. So they've got the bandwidth, uh, both in terms of uh, the, the actual uh, technology side of things, but in terms of the policy and the funding side. That is up until the uh, oil <laughs> drop uh, in the economy, which is affecting Alberta now directly. So Alberta tends to be a boomer bust kind of uh, place, and so they're spinning a little bit off. But lots of initiatives around OER and MOOCs, uh, open badges, uh, they've done a lot of sharing in Alberta. Um, and very locally, and it's now starting to drift over the borders into both Saskatchewan as well as British Columbia, which tends to be sort of, again, a bit of a geographical uh, fix. So the other thing that's interesting about Alberta is that even though uh, the ministry right now is not uh, in a leadership position because of the economic changes and political changes, uh, they're still maintaining a lot of the uh, curriculum redesign, the high school flex program, a lot of things that are really looking and depending on uh, an online presence and technology base uh, that will continue to, to, to ri give rise to innovative practices. And there is a real support for innovation in, in uh, the area as well. When it comes to British Columbia, <laughs> and, and Michael Barber uh, calls it, and I, I've lived in it, it's the most highly regulated province when it comes to online learning. Um, in terms of uh, what happens. And they've opened up and changed policy to allow anyone to have what they call a distributed learning school, which is where students are can be at any distance and come from any part of the province. So uh, anyone can sign up a student to take an online course from anywhere in the province or through independent or anything. So as a result, there's been a, a, an interesting mix of different uh, approaches in there. The regulation is, is something which uh, is, is beginning to, at first it was enabling in terms of the policy, and now it can be uh, seen to be a little bit disabling. So there's been a, a, a real shift in the province towards an integrated approach, not just having an online school in each school district, but having it integrated with classroom practice. So there's been a real move towards blended because in the online schools, or called distributed learning schools, there's both compliance and quality uh, metrics and expectations that have been laid down in policy and legislation. So at the same time, while they have to prove that they've spent the money correctly and have evidence from students, that's the audit side, there's also uh, a, an agreement that they have to be meeting or beating standards, as well as uh, have a, a quality focus and success. Uh, within the programs. So it's it's a tough haul for a lot of folks in that area, and they're finding a little bit more ability in innovation uh, back in the, um, in the classroom base so that they can dodge a little bit of the policy and the agreement structure uh, for that. And that's where we're seeing a lot more, again, blending coming in. So making sense of what's happening across Canada, and then I want to open it up for some comments and questions about how this might be related to what you're seeing in terms of practices in your own areas. So in online, many of the programs, that, like elsewhere, evolve from distance ed initiatives. Um, at the same time, classroom-based practices have started to integrate and use technology, which now moves them into the online environment. But what's interesting, in, in uh, and this is not research that has been hard-coded, so it's not quantitative. It's more qualitative and anecdotal, but the shift from classroom to online appears to be easier than moving from what was traditionally a distance education approach or online exclusively to a blended. Yet um, both are happening across the country and both are, are seen as a desirable space to be in uh, for teachers um, driven by metrics of success, of, of graduation, of course completion, 
uh, people are finding that, uh, particularly in K-12, it doesn't work the same quite in the post-secondary, but in K-12, you kind of need to see the whites of the eyes and, you know, every once in a while, put a hand on the shoulder. Uh, and, and really, the engagement of learning is happening in those areas. How it's happening, there's a whole variety of different things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about one of the schools, Navigate NIDES, uh, which received an INACL Innovation Award, um, is really focused on, on part-time in the building and part-time independently working on flexible projects for students. So they've really kind of just given up on the concept of what's classroom and what's online in terms of the differentiation. It just really said it's about learning and sometimes we'll learn as a group and sometimes you'll learn independently and when you learn independently you can do that online if you want to be home you want to be out in the community so they've really kind of suspended that in locals in local parentis uh, and that custodial function and pushed a lot more responsibility back to parents as well and that kind of practice is happening elsewhere where the Carnegie unit is no longer seen as being a critical piece and that's also what's happening in the flex, high school flex programs in Alberta. So a lot of shifting uh, into that sort of uh, blurred area. But again, because of the structure, practices, policy, funding, those that were strictly distance education programs are finding it more difficult to move into that blended area than those that are classroom teachers. Um, so, as well, um, some of the traditional distance ed, like our Alberta's Argyle uh, Center, is one of the, I was happy to see uh, live online. <laughs> now, while they have students at a distance and they have play folks across, uh, students across the province, they do a lot of synchronous. Uh, they do a lot of structured um, and they shifting away from the any pace, any place, any time kind of approach. Uh, to a lot, lot more sort of teacher structured, um, some parent involvement, obviously, and some student choice within that for independence, but also with clear expectations. And Karen just texted a comment as well, the same thing from, from classroom to independent. Um, ADLC is a provincial uh, distance education program and provider, um, but it's also looking to build partnerships with schools and teachers so that while the content teacher may be at a distance, uh, the the school-based or community-based uh, individual is not. So they offer in partnership that kind of a combined approach and have really pursued that uh, and will continue to pers pursue that. So in the same sense, there's the partnerships that are starting to emerge between some of the public and, and the, uh, the Catholics as well as the more rural areas. So you get uh, this school districts divisions coming together to share resources through uh, learning object repositories, through a Moodle hub, uh, where they're sharing content courses uh, and a lot more of really sort of facilitated dialogue. And that's coming through sort of a, a federated approach in Alberta. It's been it's sort of embedded in BC for a while. Uh, and what we're finding then is that seems to be supporting some of the work that those folks are doing. Ontario has it as well. And that's why we're looking to kind of help uh, across Canada to, to cross-pollinate, so to speak, between these jurisdictions. But everything's sort of centering into the middle in terms of what we're finding a practice as it's evolving. The other interesting thing, and this comes out of BC, and sorry, I have a BC footprint, and uh, but this is interesting data about uh, the importance of this around completion, because BC really tracks a lot of data. Students in 2009 that were taking one or more online courses um, did poorer, they did not have a high graduation rate. Um, in completion for their public school program as those students that were not taking an online course. But by 2012, it flipped. So in essence, for whatever reason, and this hasn't been determined, but for whatever reason, whether it be that they're getting the course that they couldn't at their school or that they're learning to be better independent learners because they're working online or whatever the reasons are, those students that are taking one or more courses online now have a better completion rate of high school than those that are just in a classroom. Thought that was an interest. And it could be that all the top of the bell curve is migrating into online, and maybe that's why that number is skewed. So it's just a number of different factors, but what it does say to us is that online is definitely here to stay, and it's very, very important. So what have we learned in terms of things across Canada? Well, you can see it there. It's blurred, it's not perfect. It happens in different ways, depending on such factors as geography, policy, funding, 
um, jurisdiction, whether it's uh, federally funded at First Nations, uh, whether it is Francophone or whether it is Anglophone in Ontario or in Alberta or in Nova Scotia. But all are flip, moving towards personalization and flexibility. Uh, yet, and challenge, correct me if I'm wrong for Sue, Michael, or Karen or others, there hasn't really been a large talk of competency based here quite as yet as it is in the US. So that's one of the differences. While personal, personal learning and flexible learning are drivers, not so much a core competency. And across Canada, again, as I mentioned, First Nations and Francophone better organized, that's out of just sheer survival. Um, and the research focus uh, for us in Canny Learn is really moving towards getting better data and, and exposing and exploring those pockets of innovation and sharing that across the country. So that's essentially where we're hoping to go and why we're doing this through this, this emerging network. We have seen pockets uh, of, of great innovation and we are actually trying to recognize them. So uh, we leveraged because we don't have it in our network as yet, but uh, we've been using the INACL Innovator Awards to shine a light on Canadian practice. And over the past three years, um, sorry, this slide I forgot to update. Over the past three years now, uh, Canadians have been recognized for an innovation award. First, it was Audrey McLaren and Peggy Droulet at LEARN um, and Michael's uh, initiative. Uh, Verena Roberts, when she was, uh, who is now with Candy Learn, obviously, as well, part-time, um, through work that she was doing with the Alberta Distance Learning Center uh, in terms of uh, the first K-12 open MOOC, as well as the open classroom and other open initiatives that she spearheaded uh, for that year. Uh, was recognized, and then this past year as well, uh, the Navigate program for N N Navigate uh, Noat Nights in Courtney, British Columbia, was recognized for their creation. We also found that Josh Gray, in terms of the work that he was doing in London, Ontario, we nominated him and shone the light back across Canada. Um, and Maurice Berry, who was instrumental over the past number of years for the Distance Learning uh, Innovation Center for St. John's in Newfoundland, Labrador as well. Not to mention as well our good colleague and avid uh, advocate for supporting and building the Canadian e-learning network, uh, Michael Barber, in terms of his research as well. Michael's now at, uh, at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, but continues to have a passion and uh, support uh, initiatives that are happening in Canada. So that's what we're hoping to continue to do to create some, some recognition, but the tension within our own country. Um, so that there's a lot of things that are going on um, was was very much so. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk. I want to talk a little bit about next steps, but I want to open it up for some discussion and commentary uh, from the, those of you here about how does this resonate with what uh, you're seeing in your own practices? How does this compare to other countries or other areas? Uh, and then I want to bring it back to the question of, of where should we be focusing our research that can help contribute to others, but what you may think will be help support us. So open dialogue discussion. Anything else to add to that? Randy, it's Justin. So um, I have a question, and this obviously I don't want to paint the entire country of Canada very broadly, but maybe you can point me to some kind of direct instances. Are there are there any kind of specific legal requirements for mentoring of uh, distance learners or online learners, like on-site mentors for kids in public schools, maybe differences across provinces, and, and have you seen anything, uh, maybe some that you can point to effects of whether or not uh, a student might have a mentor in, in a classroom for an online class? We do pretty much the same thing here in Quebec. We have a an online and it's a t mentoring tutorial system that it works uh, for all, all uh, children, all students, the elementary and high school level. In the French side of Quebec, uh, uh, they do the same thing through a program called Allopof. These are, um, uh, but they're not necessarily uh, uh, assigned uh, to a particular student. They're just uh, resources that are online uh, that can be uh, um, 
reached uh, through synchronous programs, uh, they can be there to help us more along the lines of homework assistance than they would call it truly uh, mentoring. But it's been going on and for, we have uh, well over 10,000 students on a weekly basis who come on in the evenings uh, and work with our tutors and, uh, and they get homework assistance uh, guidance in a variety of ways. And on the, the uh, French side, it's about the same thing. So uh, it's, a, it's a very popular service, but um, it's not, it doesn't really address the students on a, uh, on a personal level. They, they just come on and uh, they'll, they'll get a seek request and uh, assistance in that particular way. Michael, thank you. Yeah, Andy. And Sue has oh. indicated. Go ahead, Justin. Sorry, I was actually just going to uh, highlight what Sue had written in the chat that window there for the purposes of our recording. She says, they have contact teachers who supervise and support students at every school site who are chosen by the school and part of the agreement with the teachers union and that they're going to have an online short course for all middle level learners to introduce them to online learning so it'll be something more familiar when they reach high school. Yeah, thanks. Yes, I was just going to highlight the same thing. Um, so while there, there's also there's mentorship for teachers, there's also programs and support that's mentoring for students. Uh, definitely both are key aspects to that because, again, like we said at the beginning of this session, let's keep technology transparent and out of the way and not make it about tech. But uh, in order to get uh, engaged, uh, we have to help people get past some of those roadblocks. In the same way as teaching online is has its, its own challenges, um, even webinars online sometimes can have challenges as well. Um, so. You know, some of the thoughts about where, where do we go from here is sort of like what, and I want to come back to sort of the, the network, the e-learning network that we're evolving across Canada. And we've called, we've given it a construct called the Center for Innovation. Uh, it's more of a, a, a construct, uh, artificial, it's not a physical place and it's not a, a, a digital place as it exists as yet. But some of the things that we we are trying to do to bridge across Canada and support some of the things that are happening uh, is a project that's just launching a Pan-Canadian English Resource Project uh, to try to pool together resources and uh, share uh, in English uh, across Canada. Because again, remember everything's provincially funded and provincially driven. So. Are there resources in Ontario that might be shareable in, uh, in BC, in Newfoundland, in uh, the territories, in Nova Scotia? Absolutely, and the same in the reverse. So that's some of the things that we're starting to do. Uh, the easiest space and the more important space to be in as well is, is focused learning, both for teachers. Um, again, the support for students is not something that we as a network are looking to do. That's the provincial mandate and is occurring. But we can do things such as webinars as these. We can share research. Uh, we've created an open course on teaching and learning online for specifically for teachers. Um, and then we can, we've also are going to offer that up as a facilitated um, event um, for, for folks that join in the network so that we can actually give them some degree of badge or credential or certificate. We're also working with our post-secondary institutions to uh, jump in and create a pre-service teacher certificate course about teaching online. There's interest out of the University of Lethbridge for doing that at a master's level as well. And then we foster and support local, regional, and national events and we bring a provincial limelight to it. We have a lot more folks that are interested in attending an event, uh, maybe in another part of the country and building a network. And so we've done things such as going to the Bring IT Together conference in Ontario uh, and had a number of folks come. There's been provincial events in BC that people have come to, created and fostered an event in Ontario, uh, as well as uh, meetings and other things in Quebec. And we're looking very forward to coming out to our beautiful East Coast uh, for an event in Nova Scotia soon, right, Sue? <laughs> um, and we're also building a site and a place for people to share. So we're, again, leveraging off tools and technologies and spaces that people already have or are using. So we're not building anything new. We're just simply uh, trying to foster and, and develop some sharing and, and across. And of course, because of the nature of what we're doing here, research, research, research is um, really a core driver to us. Uh, both in terms of research that we can do to bring a light to what's happening in practice in Canada. And we, were, we are taking the State of the Nation report 
and putting it into an online repository and then we'll re be publishing a more comprehensive uh, report as well as part of that. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're kind of focused on and moving towards. And I'll leave last comments uh, from others about where we're going as a network to maybe, uh, Michael or to Sue or to uh, Karen who has some activity as well. I think you've done a great job covering a lot of these points. I would maybe just wanted to add one thing is that very often uh, uh, just being, uh, being aware that others are working in the same field as you and um, finding out what challenges that they have and sharing a little bit, um, you get that support that it, it's always appreciated. And, this, and especially because uh, we, it's such a large geographical expanse uh, Canada and the, uh, we don't have the opportunity very often to, to get together. So uh, the Canadian eLearning Network is providing us with this opportunity to get together and not just at, the, and although we always appreciate it, uh, not just at the IACOL events once a year. So we now have a chance to get together to share, um, and as I said, to talk about our challenges, about the opportunities, um, and share our successes. So it, it, while we're looking at the, a very practical side of things, it's just good to know that there are others out there um, uh, working uh, uh, on the same in the same field, and that we have an opportunity to uh, to collaborate, to uh, to get to know one another, and uh, at the same time. So um, that, I just wanted to add that, Randy. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it has been good. And as Sue's texted, it's been a bit benefit to connect with others. And, and uh, just to stitch that together, I, I think of it as the Canadian quilt. It's essentially what we're trying to do is, is stitch those parts of the quilt together just to help build uh, and support uh, 2003 Drum. Um, okay, excellent. So thanks for, for sharing that. There have been some excellent things that are happening here in Canada, but often because of the, for a variety of reasons, we do, we, we, we are in isolation. So we're hoping to, to bring those together as well. Yeah, and, and there is, has been a lot more uh, blended. So really where we see things going is, is a tremendous amount of energy in, and practice towards uh, coming out of the classroom uh, base and a lot more high school flexibility and elementary schools as well that are starting to build towards. Of course, we have our issues that we have to deal with in terms of freedom of information, protection of privacy, which are huge drivers for a lot of jurisdictions. And some um, are still, I would say, um, have a bit of a just block them attitude towards that, whereas others uh, are moving towards a more informed consent uh, support education for students uh, around how to work effectively with technology and in online environments. We have a lot of people moving towards uh, Google, uh, you know, uh, sites and approaches uh, integrated across. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, movement towards uh, building that. Um, but again, we need to share a lot more across our provincial jurisdictions because some are doing things way better than others. That others could learn from. We're not at that policy advocacy uh, area and it, because of the nature both of the network but also of the way in which uh, things work. So we're not really INACL North as an organization in that, that light of it. Uh, we're a much more of a professional learning organization stitching things together for practitioners. Um, although as we learn and share, um, there may be individuals in the network that work within their own jurisdictions that want to foster some changes in policy legislation or influence how their own provincial jurisdictions uh, are managed around the levels of blended or online. But that's something which is up to those individuals. So I wanted to take the opportunity at this point in time to certainly thank those of you that are here. Thanks for the contributions uh, for that. Uh, I do have some contact information, but I would like to stick around if anybody has questions about the network, about what's happening in Canada, and just uh, continue with that dialogue. Verena is pretty active, and she does really apologize for not being here. She tried her best, but uh, ended up in, in a conflict that she could not um, uh, work out. <laughs> so, um, so she has um, sent her regards, but there's her contact information. She's pretty active out there. Those of you that tweet or, or blog, etc., you probably know Verena quite well. but. Do want to say thank you uh, for this and thanks for the contributions of others and uh, turn it back over to 
you folks for any other comments or Justin, any other things or Catherine? This is Catherine. I did have a, a quick question um, for those who wanted to field it, uh, whether it be Karen, Michael, or I think Sue's already left. Um, but we wanted to know a little bit more about any kind of influence that you see from third parties in the space within Canada. Um, is there anybody um, that's driving the effort in terms of vendors or have you seen a lot of activity for, from for-profit industries versus the traditional education establishment? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, it, it kind of shines a light back in terms of how we manage those connections as a network as well. Uh, there's a lot of corporate partners that are trying to support learning uh, in the same way. They're trying to service a need. So a number come to light. Uh, we have some homegrown Canadian uh, companies as well. That, uh, but I don't, I don't get a sense. It's not quite the same in terms of uh, policy driven through a corporate approach. I think the corporate folks are just trying to support the learning. Um, but Michael, you may have some more commentary on that as well. Yeah, I, I think because you have education as a provincial jurisdiction, a lot of the larger um, for-profit uh, uh, organizations such as Blackboard, D2L, and, and others um, have a great deal of difficulty dealing with uh, Canadians generally, simply because uh, every province approaches things differently. Um, as Randy was mentioning in Ontario, in, uh, in British Columbia, for example, they have a um, highly regulated uh, um, uh, province, and they uh, they address a lot of their educational issues in one particular way. Whereas in uh, in Quebec, uh, um, we really have, when it comes to uh, online learning, uh, there there are no uh, rules and regulations. And, and everyone's it's a little bit of a free for all, uh, and and whereas and then you go to Nova Scotia where you have a a, a provincially run virtual school, uh, I think this causes a great deal of uh, difficulty for the um, uh, the larger providers simply because they can't they can't find one model that suits everyone, and some of our markets are really too small for them to uh, start to adjust and adapt, and very often they're trying to impose um, pricing models and schedules that. Uh, don't work here. So I, uh, my sense is that they're having um, generally a rough time overall, although you see some com uh, organizations such as D2L you know, in the province of Ontario desire to learn is, is very much integrated into the whole uh, fabric uh, of uh, their uh, online uh, schooling uh, and education there. But it's a, uh, my general uh, impression is that the, there's a lot of frustration there when it comes to addressing this. So the, no, there are no I don't think any strong movements or, or partners in that particular area. I don't know what you, if you you agree, Randy, but that's my sense of things. I, I absolutely. I think and Karen indicated that Follett is you know launched a student information system and provincially here. So uh, there are influencers certainly within provinces. Desire to learn is you know got a provincial license in Ontario. Um, but what I find it what's interesting, is, Catherine, is maybe almost the reverse. Is that when you look at some of the technologies and the things that have been created. Uh, WebCT came out of UBC in, in Vancouver, uh, in British Columbia, became, uh, you know, sort of now Blackboard Learn. Uh, Illuminate, which is now Collaborate, Blackboard Collaborate, came out of Calgary uh, for that. Desire to Learn came uh, and is, is working. I can even think of some, a, a, a company that I just became aware of that's creating content, eDynamic uh, Learning. Uh, they're based out of uh, Alberta in Edmonton. Um, they've got a great cache in the U.S., but really not much in Canada. It's really the nature of uh, both the, the funding that is within jurisdictions in the provinces uh, and the geography and the size. So the really corporate influence is, is not as large. Pearson certainly has a presence across uh, Canada in many of the provinces and the ways, um, but are they driving an agenda? No, not really. Nelson Education and Nelson Canada is a Canadian-based company uh, in this publishing realm as well. Um, they'd like to have, uh, you know, some influence, etc. But but they really are more in the the stand back support. And so for us as a network, uh, there are some really good tools. Again, like there's good practices, and what we try to do through the network is bring attention to that um, and find uh, a sort of a, a synergy that supports 
the end outcome, which is which is learning. But no, it, it's a good question, and I know it's one that came up for Inaco, uh and Matt Wicks when he was we were chatting about it. It was really important to see that corporate have some involvement in in this enterprise, but that it does not be seen to be driving. So in Canada, I think just by nature of the country, uh, we don't really have that concern quite yet, if at all. If Any I'm other questions? Just Joe. Yeah, Joe has a question, uh, Randy, about uh, uh, teacher prep programs uh, and, and producing teachers ready to teach in the online environment. Uh, I can tell you from, because I've, I've spoken to a number of universities, and I think I don't know if Michael Barber is still with us, I don't think so. But um, from what I've seen generally, um, there's there really isn't much going on. There's There may be courses here and there, but uh, most of our universities, I would say, in central and eastern Canada are um, falling short on that side of things. And, and very often, here's a, a little slam against the, the universities, is very often they'll have online teaching models and, and programs that are that really reflect uh, what was going on maybe four or five years ago and really aren't current. So uh, the ones that I have seen um, are really not very good and, uh, and, and they're really not uh, pervasive. So most teachers coming out of the universities right now uh, uh, um, are not ready for this, have little to no preparation. And, uh, and that's a, uh, something that uh, I think universities will have to address going forward. But that's Absolutely. my general sense right now. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's why I went back to this slide, is that what we're doing is we're working on, we built an open course. We're going to have our own facilitated course on teaching online. We're working with other institutions on pre-service, master's level uh, as well. So definitely. Um, it, 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 UVic, um, okay, in their teacher ed program. It, it's evolving, it's, it's occurring. There are pockets again uh, of individuals that are really working towards that. I can say uh, David Porter, who used to be exec director of a BC campus and post-secondary, is now working on a whole flexible learning initiative out of SFU, which is integrating back into their whole education program. So it is happening. We want to be in those conversations and we want to help support moving that forward. It's definitely a challenge. Uh, as well, but so is in-service teachers who want to work with technology. So again, those events uh, we foster a lot that are both skill building but also pedagogically sound in terms of their approach in working with technology. That's an area which is just rife for us as a network. Good question. I don't know whether you're going to pick up on that, but I will for the recording as well. So Catherine's comment is that educators are busy on the ground doing the work, that they don't have time to get the research done, that word out or share. And yes, that's the network or networks we're trying to build are really trying to do that, both within the provincial jurisdictions, but also uh, across the country. So uh, that's something which is in the dialogues early on, Catherine. We've really been trying to ensure that a national overshadow anything to do with what's happening at the at the ground level in each of the provinces. So rather than being a top-down group, we're really a grassroots facilitating and supporting those levels of interaction and dialogue and those connections at that level. And if there's a national twist that will help, then we put that into the mix of them as well. But yes, no, really good questions, good commentary. Because yes, teachers are busy. Um, we have the opportunity to leverage what we have nationally to uh, to support them and to uh, get them to uh, better informed, better uh, trained, better able to engage learners using some technologies and blended and online. So thanks. Over to you, Justin. Thank you, Randy. Uh, thanks everyone else who contributed, Michael, Sue, Karen. Thank you all for sharing your perspectives and some insights on uh, what's happening in Canada. Uh, we are running close to time here, so uh, I did want to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, again, thank you so much to our presenter, Randy, and thank you for everyone who joined us. Uh, we want to make mention of a project that we are currently working on, which will be held uh, as a pre-conference workshop to the INA Call Blended and Online Learning Symposium on November 8th. I will let Catherine talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, we just got word uh, this this week that we have been approved to host the online and blended learning research community meeting 
It will be all day on the workshop day for INACOL, November 8th. So we wanted to get the work out, or word out, so that people can um, make sure to think about maybe coming the day before, uh, uh, and that would be great. Um, we're also going to probably have some planning meetings um, to kind of get your take on how we should set up that meeting um, so that we can all benefit um, from each other's work. So thanks so much. I'm going to hand it back over to Justin. Thank you, Catherine. And just uh, a couple more things to advertise before we wrap up. Uh, we did want to make mention that we have recently launched a new project, our MVLRI podcast, which is called Virtual Viewpoints. Uh, the aim of the podcast is really to amplify the voices of those who are working in K-12 online and blended learning and see how we can use their stories to demonstrate the power of applicable research. So uh, we'll be sitting down with practitioners, policymakers, administrators, and researchers to kind of share their stories. So if you'd like to check out the very first episode uh, with Dr. Tracy Weeks, uh, who works at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And if you're interested in uh, being a guest on the podcast, please feel free to drop me a line, I will leave my email in the chat window. We hope you enjoy that project. And again, our uh, next webinar will be next Wednesday, February 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'll be picking back up with our mentoring series where we'll be examining mentor orientation and training. We'll hear from Jared Borup, who is a fellow of the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, a faculty member at George Mason University our own uh, executive director of MVLRI here, Joe Friedhoff, and Julie Howe from Three Rivers Public Schools, uh, which oversees uh, a great online mentoring program in Three Rivers, Michigan. Becky has also made mention in the chat window there that we're looking for guest bloggers. Uh, we do have a, a great guest blogger program, so if you're interested in writing a blog post for us, check out the link that's posted in the chat window there to learn more about that program. And in the meantime, if you'd like to reach out to us, give us some feedback on our webinar process or any of our other projects, please feel free to email us at mvlri at mivu.org. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Our handles are listed there. And our LinkedIn, YouTube, and webinars pages are also uh, hyperlinked there in the presentation. The YouTube channel is where we post the recordings of all of our webinars. And the webinars page there will give you a look a little bit at the uh, upcoming webinars that we have on our schedule. Uh, I will actually, if Becky uh, has some microphone capabilities, maybe she could possibly talk a little bit about the guest blogger program or Catherine, whoever would like to jump in there. I'm not sure that Becky has microphone privileges yet, um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and approach um, Diane's message. So Diane, um, the guest blogging is uh, usually a one-time thing, um, and you apply for it, but we also, um, you can go ahead and, and send in content if you'd like us to post it as well. But the guest blogger is a program. If you go to that link, it will tell you more about it. It's, it's usually just a one-time thing. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks, Randy, for uh, dropping that contact there. We should get those folks connected. Uh, if anyone else has any comments, suggestions, feedback for us, please leave it in the chat window or drop us a line through email. Uh, thank you. It looks like Michael has also shared that those interested who may want to look at the peer-reviewed journal called Learning Landscapes, uh, the latest edition deals with teacher training, and the link can be found there in the chat window at learninglandscapes.ca. Alrighty, I'll let uh, the rest of the conversation play out in the chat window there. <laughs> Thanks, Randy, for the compliment. I appreciate it. And you are a great presenter, so uh, the compliment is repaid. I hope everyone enjoys their weekend. Uh, make the rest of your Friday a great one. Take care, everyone.